My eyes are always on the Lord, for he rescues my feet from the snare. Turn to me and have mercy on me, for I am alone and poor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning. Coming into the presence of the Lord has called to mind our sinfulness. You came to heal the contrite of heart, Lord of mercy. You came to call sinners, Christ of mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to plead for us, Lord of mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O God, author of every mercy and all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Exodus. God spoke all these words. He said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no gods except me. You shall not utter the name of the Lord your God to misuse it. For the Lord will not leave unpunished the man who utters his name to misuse it. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honour your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land the Lord your God has given to you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his servant man or woman, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is his. The word of the Lord. The response this morning, you, Lord, have the message of eternal life. You, Lord, have the message of eternal life. The law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The rule of the Lord is to be trusted. It gives wisdom to the simple. You, Lord, have the message of eternal life. The precepts of the Lord are right. They gladden the heart. The command of the Lord is clear. It gives light to the eyes. You, Lord, have the message of eternal life. The fear of the Lord is holy, abiding forever. The decrees of the Lord are truth, and all of them just. You, Lord, have the message of eternal life. They are more to be desired than gold, than the purest of gold, and sweeter are they than honey, than honey from the comb. You, Lord, have the message of eternal life. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. While the Jews demand miracles, and the Greeks look for wisdom. Here are we preaching a crucified Christ, to the Jews an obstacle that they cannot get over, to the pagans madness, but to those who have been called, whether they are Jews or Greeks, a Christ who is the power and wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord and the gospel acclamation. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Just before the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem and in the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting at their counters there. Making a whip out of some cord, he drove them all out of the temple, cattle and sheep as well. Scattered the money changers coins, knocked their tables over and said to the pigeon sellers, take all this out of here and stop turning my father's house into a market. Then his disciples remember the words of scripture, zeal for your house will devour me. The Jews intervened and said, what sign can you show us to justify what you have done? Jesus answered, destroy this sanctuary and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this sanctuary. Are you going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the sanctuary that was his body and when Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scriptures and the words he had said. During this stay in Jerusalem for the Passover, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he gave. But Jesus knew them all and did not trust himself to them. He never needed evidence about any man. He could tell what a man had in him. The Gospel of the Lord. So the first reading is about the Ten Commandments. So uh, I could waken you all up by thumping the pulpit and telling you that you must not murder and you must not commit adultery and you must not steal, which was a form of preaching that certainly kept you awake and made you listen. Um, yeah, the Ten Commandments, they're kind of like ten gems that have been carved out of the Jewish tradition. So in the book of Exodus or uh, Leviticus or whichever one it comes from, the book of the law, they have about 800 rules. And in the middle of them you get these 10 commandments, which turn out to be really genius in terms of civilization. To have a civilized society, you need to keep the 10 commandments. Um, the Jews were very strong on their book of the law. So that is those 10 commandments at the center, but the other 800 rules too. And of course, what we're all looking for is some form of salvation. So they would have tried to keep all the rules and be very law abiding in order to save themselves that way. But somehow it didn't quite work. So you have a great discussion in the New Testament with Paul especially, but you have it between Jesus and the Pharisees about keeping the rules. And Jesus seems to the Pharisees to be a little bit lax about it. Um, nevertheless, Jesus does say, at some, he says, I haven't come to abolish the law, but to perfect it. So the law was meant to educate us, to train us to be civilized, to even train us to be holy and show the way, but it didn't succeed because we, all, all that happened was we failed to keep it and we ended up kind of being feel, feeling guilty and being self-critical. So what Jesus um, is, is offering and what Paul spells out a lot is that he doesn't just give you the power to keep the law, he gives you the Holy Spirit of love poured into your heart. He gives you love, which is ultimately what it's about, how you relate to people, to God himself, and indeed to nature as well. Um, it's that basic development that comes out of love that makes you perfect in that way. So um, that's Jesus' answer to it. One way he expresses it in the New Testament, then he, what he gives us the Old Testament gives us the Ten Commandments as the center of our religious efforts. Jesus gives us the Beatitudes. So he tells you that you should be poor in spirit, that the meek inherit the land, that you should be for justice, 
and you are blessed, you'll be happy if you hunger and thirst after justice, and all those things in the Beatitudes. A different way of expressing it, um, but in between we need a bit of education. So if you take the issue, which is in today's Gospel, of anger, how does that fit in? Well, first of all, the Old Test Testament said, you shall not kill, or you shall not murder. I can say that with 100% confidence. I can thump the pulpit and rave about it here. Uh, and some of you would like that form of preaching. The thing is that most of you here, it's not an issue for you killing people. So there's no point doing it at 8.30 on a Sunday morning uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't affect you that much. However, it is an important absolute is that you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. But already in the definition of murder and adultery is something that's totally forbidden. Um, so that's the absolute statement of it. But then you find Jesus talking about fulfilling the law and he talks about you shouldn't even be angry towards your brother. And if you are, you have to go, go away from the church and stop offering sacrifice and um, reconcile yourself with your brother. So he's really brought it to a, another extreme. One of the results of that probably is we tend to, we, we've tend to not deal with anger uh, fully in a lot, of our, a lot of our culture, but also a lot of our church uh, teaching. And in fact, even some people will come to confession and say, confess the sin of feeling angry, which of course it's not a sin to feel angry. The sin is when you do the wrong thing out of your anger. So a little bit of dealing with anger uh, today. If you want to know how to act morally, have a look at Jesus. He, he's the one who, as it said there, he knew what's in our hearts. He, know, he can read people. He has that wisdom of knowing the right thing to do and the right way to be. So in today's readings, he gets angry. And he goes up to the temple. He sees the money changers in the temple and the people selling the animals for sacrifice. And he gets angry and he turns over their tables, kicks the stuff on the floor, kicks them out of the, out of this, uh, the temple. Um, so a, a very spectacular manifestation of anger. So if Jesus doesn't sin, there must be no sin in some anger. There must be even a proper anger, or we call it a righteous anger. Uh, Paul says to us in his letter to the Ephesians, he says, uh, be angry, but don't sin. So he is actually saying there's something in anger that you have to allow. Um, just to explain Jesus there in this spectacular thing, I can't quite fully, um, because it's a very spectacular part of the, the, the gospel, because from that day on, the, the high priests... Uh, decided they were going to kill Jesus. Because they can't have him acting like that in the temple. The temple was the most sacred place, and he acts like that. And while they were very unhappy with him for a long time, now they actually decide they're going to kill him. So, and Jesus probably realizes that. It's pretty well a week before his death. That's why it's in the middle of um, Lent. Um, so what's going on there? Well, one, it's a kind of a righteous anger. It's an anger against the system. He had developed a lot of um, uh, uh, irritation with the high priests, and they were very irritated by him because he seems to be critical of their way of living and their way of carrying out uh, religion. They had allied themselves with Herod, who was the the ruler of the area, and a bit with the Roman Empire, Roman, the Roman rulers too, but especially with Herod. Um, and when you get religion and the state lining up together, quite often you get a very, a, 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 a set of values that are totally anti-Christian. Um, usually values in favour of war, values in favour of uh, treating people oppressively, um, imposing taxes, all that sort of thing, that really Christianity is, and Jesus would be saying the opposite. 
So you find that the high priests and Herod and the Romans in Jerusalem at the same time were an oppressive force. They were a system of oppression towards the people. Um, it shows itself there in the temple around the question of sacrifice. There were three levels of sacrifice. There was the, they said, cattle, sheep, and pigeons. So the richer people could afford to buy cattle or sheep and sacrifice them. Um, it was the poorer people who bought the pigeons. And the, and the poor were being exploited in having to pay for the pigeons in the first place. But also, they were having to pay to make their friendship with God. So that seems to be a wrong sort of, a wrong sort of uh, leadership to make people feel so oppressed that they have to give their money over in order to be, for, for God to be pleased with them. Um, there is a deeper kind of a problem there is the question of sacrifice. Jesus basically abolished um, the system of sacrificing to God uh, it had been, it's been there since the beginning, it's some sort of a, it's a natural thing in people. However, it's a very primitive form of religion. And since Jesus, we haven't been offering sacrifice in that way of offering animals or indeed um, produce of the farm, maybe produce of the farm to some extent. Our sacrifice is in fact breaking the bread and sharing the, the bread, which is the body of Christ, which is a very, an extremely peaceful sort of thing. So Jesus, for any reasons, is annoyed by the temple. It's also that the trading had, and the changing of the money and so on, had, had moved into the inner sanctuary of the temple, which was meant to be holy. It was really meant to stay in the outer courts of the temple. So that might have been another thing that annoyed him. Uh, it probably is reasonable enough to say, have money changers because people Jewish people came to Jerusalem from many countries with many currencies, so there should be money changing. Um, if the system is of offering animals, well, you have to provide the animals and sell them to people, so that seems reasonable enough. But there's something that really gets on Jesus' nerves here, and it probably is that the whole system was exploitative, and it's possible even that the high priests were making money out of the system, but it doesn't actually say that there. Um, so something like that that gets up to energy, but there's something deeper that I really can't get a, a grip of. Um, but now the expression of Jesus' anger. Um, the thing about anger is we're afraid of it because obviously it can be a wildfire that goes too far. Um, and a lot of us have to go for anger management courses to get our, get our lives in order. Um, so there is that danger with anger that you have to control it. There's also been the teaching, both in the culture and sometimes the religion, of anger is wrong, which isn't quite the case. Anger is an energy. It expresses something. So it's quite correct and healthy to be outraged at something that is outrageous. So in a sense, if you're healthy, you should be feeling quite angry at injustice, at unjust systems, systems that exploit the black people in America have, would be quite angry with the system of white supremacy. Um, I think we'd be quite angry with the, the former system of supremacy that we had here. So there's an ongoing anger in people. Um, but what's good about it is it points out an injustice that there, something has to be done about it and the energy is there to do it. Anger in personal relations may point to the need for boundaries somebody has stepped over the, the limit in their relation to you and you need to assert that boundary. So the anger teaches you that. Um, also the anger can be transformed into something more. So you have, you, you can't, um, you, 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 anger when you meet it at first coming up in you, you don't know what it's about. It may be in a very uncomfortable feeling. Some fellow said it's like, um, if you're going to eat potatoes, if you try to eat them raw, it's pretty uncomfortable. But if you let it, if you let it cook slowly, the potatoes soften, and then they give you a nice smell, and then you put some butter on them, and they're lovely to eat. Anger can be like that, that you can cook it for a while, try and understand what it's saying, and let it transform in you. Um, 
so that in the end it's actually something that's good and it can transform into compassion and love and understanding for the other person and for the situation, but also what needs to be done. So many, paying attention to your anger and allowing it and trusting that it moves on and transforms into something uh, softer is a, a, a way of living. So Jesus there is actually showing out, um, outrage, anger, and there's no sin in that. It is an energy. It's meant to change the system. Um, and you can nurture it and change. Some people would even, um, they would cry their anger away, uh, which is a cleansing thing. It purifies you and changes anger into a kind of uh, an acceptance of other people and even the love of other people. So you can turn anger into love. They're both fire, so they can actually meet in some way and transform in some way. So um, between the Ten Commandments of thou shalt not kill uh, and feeling angry, there's a lot of nuances that you have to learn to manage. And learning to manage your, your energy of anger is an important achievement. It's probably important for us too because uh, we have suffered over long centuries oppression and there's kind of all sorts of triggers inside us of, of, of anger. Um, rather than deny it and pretend it's not there, we need to allow it and trust that we can manage it in a civilized way. Um, if you deny it and say that it's not there or you don't face up to it, you tend, it, never, it doesn't die, it's in there and it works away. And as you can see, it can, it can burst out every century in, 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 in unfortunate ways. Also, when you come up against things like that are happening today in the wars in the Middle East and so on, um, yeah, we shouldn't be just neutral. There should be a, 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 an outraged anger about it so that something gets done about it somewhere. So always look to Jesus, who knows what's in people and knows how to uh, behave. So anger is not to be written off immediately, but it's to be um, managed and transformed into love. And in the end, love is always the way of acting. Somehow Jesus doesn't react during after the week after that when he's being, being tortured and killed. But he does act out of love in his resurrection. So it's love that brings the risen life again. And it's out of love that we move forward. So let us pray. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. St. Paul reminds us, we believe in a Christ who is the power and wisdom of God, a Christ who continually intercedes on our behalf with the Father, and so with confidence we bring our requests before him. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and our Bishop Eamon, 
and all church leaders. May their leadership be an inspiration to us as we celebrate this penitential season. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For our young people, that they may learn to respond to the Holy Spirit's guidance and be the wonderful force for good that God wants them to be in our world. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for parents of young children and teenagers who are entrusted with the enormous responsibility of passing on the faith to the next generation. May they trust that the Lord is with them every step of the way. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For all who are unwell at this time, that they may be uplifted by Jesus' constant attention to all who are hurting, as we, are so often, as we see so often reflected in the Gospels. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. May we see our coming together each week to celebrate the Eucharist as an occasion of great grace in God's sacred space and respect his presence in our midst. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those who were recently deceased, Monica, Mona McGuigan, Margaret Jean Murphy, Pat Toland, Gloria Hollywood, Margaret Harvey, Sean Hughes, and John Prentice. And those whose anniversaries are at this time, Peter McQuaid, Joseph Kelly, Patrick and Matilda Donnelly. And for those whose anniversaries are today, it's the first anniversary of Oliver Breen, Mary Catherine Campbell, Joseph McConville, Mary Agnes Dunbar, Thomas William Garvey, Patrick Marley, Patrick Kelly, Joao and Elsa de Costa, Maria and Aurea Bello, Antonio Freitas, Jose Aparicio, Ana Maria Costa Cardoso. Of those whose anniversaries were yesterday, Saturday, is the month's mind of Simon Wallace. And then we remember also Seamus O'Neill, Eta Murphy, Brian McGill, or is it McGough? Uh, Colette McAlinden, Joachim Martins da Costa, and Matthias Scamma. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, to the mercy of God, rest in peace. Loving Father, we appreciate all the blessings you give to us as we journey on our way to you. May we never take for granted your presence in our lives as we offer our thanks to you, knowing that you always answer our prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share the really refreshed bread. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we've received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Lord, wash my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours will be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. God, author of every mercy and all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by your gracious gift each year, your faithful await the sacred Paschal feasts with the joy of minds made pure, so that more eagerly intent on prayer and on the works of charity and participating in the mysteries by which they have been reborn, they may be led to the fullness of grace that you bestow on your sons and daughters. And you with our angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest, <clears throat> blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fountain of all holiness. Make holy therefore these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we will be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, with Eamon and Michael and Sean, our bishops, and all the clergy. <clears throat> Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who please you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, our mighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. Amen. So let's pray in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. O Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grace you grant her peace and duty in accordance with your will, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. We are happy to be called for supper. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep us safe to eternal life.
For anyone who drinks it, says the Lord, the water I shall give will become in him a spring welling up to eternal life. Some notices. The Knights of Columbanus have a Lenten reflection called Fish on Friday and it takes place before the Blessed Sacrament each week after the Friday evening Mass after 7.30. Um, there's a Croke Patrick climb in memory of Father Brian White and it'll be on the 5th of May Sunday and the bus trip being organized with the details and phone numbers in the parish bulletin. And there is Stations of the Cross during Lent on Sunday at 7 p.m. in this church. And the about parish records asking parishioners who wish to receive weekly envelopes and then those who've changed their address for their details to fill out an information form, which is also in the bulletin. And there's a thanks from the clergy to you for the collection of last week, which was £2,235.59, with a standing order for the month of February of £807. So let us pray. <coughs> As we receive the pledge of things yet hidden in heaven and are nourished while still on earth with the bread that comes from on high, we humbly entreat you, O Lord, that what is being brought about in us in mystery may come to true completion through Christ our Lord. Direct, O Lord, we pray, the hearts of your faithful, and in your kindness grant your servants this grace, that abiding in love for you and their neighbor, they may fulfill the whole of your commands through Christ our Lord. And the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Mass has ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you. Have a nice day.